Hello, friends and family, and welcome to our Monday, September 21st edition of our boring meditation stuff. And today I wanted to talk about tribes. I wanted to talk about tribes in two capacities. One, the accessibility or universality of a meditation practice as it pertains to tribes, which is to say how universal, how acceptable <laughs> uh, is that meditation practice to any tribe, to all tribes, um, whatever those tribes may be. And the second half is the idea that the meditation practice that a person picks up can help one to take apart uh, tribes, to dissolve tribes, and to see people across tribes, because our tribal boundaries <laughs> tend to be entirely artificial, obviously. They're products of our collective imagination. Um, so this first idea is quite a bit easier to tackle. Um, though it's not necessarily easy to say whether or not a meditation technique is precisely universal. Um, Anapana meditation is definitively universal. There is nothing about Anapana meditation that anyone could really possibly have any um, difficulty with. You can learn it in 10 minutes. It involves the most secular <laughs> meditation object available, a person's own breath. Um, and it's not ascribed to uh, any one particular school of thought or philosophy or religion or sect or anything like that. Vipassana meditation is a little more complicated um, because Vipassana meditation is much harder than Anapana meditation. It requires 10 days to learn. You cannot learn it at home. You cannot learn it from a book. You cannot learn it from a YouTube video. You will have to go to a residential Vipassana course. You will have to stay there in silence and remove all other aspects of your life for 10 days to get a glimpse of what Vipassana is about. 10 days is the minimum. Um, and for this reason, it can become a difficulty for certain people to attend 10-day Vipassana courses. You have to set aside all habits, all religious rites and rituals, um, all kinds of uh, personal formalities for 10 days. And some people have difficulty with this. And so um, in that way, it is possible to, to see Vipassana as not being as universal, perhaps, as Anapana meditation. Um, but once a person is willing to attempt Vipassana meditation, to take those 10 days, leave the rest of their life aside, go give Vipassana uh, a 10-day trial, and then go home, when they go home, they go home um, as they were. So a practicing Jew, a practicing Christian, a practicing Muslim, practicing Hindu, practicing Sikh, practicing Jain, uh, or even a practicing Buddhist, because it's often most confusing for the Buddhists <laughs> that Vipassana meditation is not taught under the banner of Buddhism. Um, it's not taught under the banner of any religion. It is taught as a completely secular activity, open and available to absolutely anyone. And um, this, this can be difficult, su sufficiently difficult for the Buddhists that they've actually taken um, violent disagreement with the way that Vipassana is taught. Um, S.N. Goenka, the principal teacher of Vipassana, went back. He was born in, um, in Burma. 
he went back to Burma at, at one point and tried to explain to people that he was not teaching Buddhism and people were offended. Um, but this quality of the meditation that anyone can practice it, anyone can remain within their own religion, there is no religion attached, um, is extremely useful because it means that it's available to anyone and that there is no encumbering um, of the teaching of the meditation by, by way of an associated religion, even tangentially associated religion. So there are meditation practices that you will see in the West nowadays in particular, um, but all over the world, which are associated with yoga, which is tangentially associated with Hinduism. And you get a lot of Hindu imagery and um, idols and gods and rituals and things kind of baked into these meditation practices or set just adjacent to the meditation practice. Um, and prior to taking my first Vipassana course, I actually took uh, a Zen meditation course. Um, and it was three days long. And even that, there was a small Buddha statue at the front of the room. E even such a small image as that uh, can, really, can really do a lot of harm um, to the meditation practice. And so there's great value in ensuring that a meditation practice is acceptable to all the various tribes of the world. So when you go for a Vipassana course, you will be often surprised to see the wide variety of races, of um, nationalities, cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, castes in India's case. Everyone is welcome. Everyone comes and sits together and meditates. Not right now obviously. No one is allowed to breathe the air of other humans at the moment, but um, when it is permitted, um, all manner of people come together and meditate together. And um, that's kind of special unto itself, but that's really more foundational to a Vipassana course than it is a sort of... It's not an advertisement. Nobody is saying, oh, Vipassana, such a wonderful, multicultural, multinational, um, multilingual thing. That's just a basic requirement of it being an internationally uh, functional meditation practice, taught the same way everywhere, um, taught in the same order everywhere, taught for 10 days everywhere, in the same physical structure. The only thing that really ever changes is the food. Um, so you go to Sri Lanka, you get Sri Lankan food, you go to Japan, you get Japanese food, so on. Um, tribes are, they're, they're a cause for difficulty for humanity. Um, and some tribes are somewhat intrinsic. So if you speak a certain language, there is a tribe associated with that. Um, I happen to speak Hebrew, or I happen to speak Japanese, or I happen to speak Swahili, or I happen to speak English. And there are certain tribes associated with those particular languages, and some tribes are larger than others, some tribes are more closed off than others, um, but they're there. And all of these tribes are, they're gossamer, right? They don't really exist. Um, they exist in our imaginations, whether it's a tribe of people who belong to one country or one religion. Um, we, we have little ceremonies, right, for changing tribes. So if I gave up my Canadian citizenship and became a citizen of Australia, um, then there's a little ceremony associated with that. Oh, so now I'm an Australian. 
um, and it, it's cute and everything, but um, it's still imaginary. And it is very easy for us to begin to see these imaginary tribes, particularly the ones that are more obvious. Um, so which country are you from? That's not written on your face. But what language you speak is a sensory input. And what color is your skin is a sensory input for another person. And those sorts of tribes are, are a, a bit difficult to break down sometimes because people feel that because there's something tangible associated with it, that the tribe itself is real. And this second half of this idea of meditation as it applies to tribes is the idea that a meditation can start to tease apart these tribes, not to break them down, not to destroy um, the language of Hebrew, right? <laughs> That's not the aim of meditation. But to genuinely see through the artificial constructs that we have built up over millennia and millennia, um, or over at least hundreds of years for the more recent tribes, um, perhaps decades for the really recent tribes. And to see other people in a more universal way. This is not a philosophy. So there are these ideas that, oh, caste doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I'm a Brahmin or it doesn't matter that I'm Kshatriya or whatever. Um, Savarna or not, right? We're all the same. Um, this is a philosophy and this doesn't, I mean, it may have its value, but it, it doesn't really help you as an individual fundamentally to subscribe to that philosophy or not. Similarly, the philosophy of um, color. Uh, there's Stephen Colbert in his previous TV show, he, he had this kind of running joke, right? About, oh, I don't see color. Um, and he would use that in an ironic fashion because as a philosophy, it's, it, it is not helpful. And um, it almost gets used in a backwards sort of way. We're in India at the moment. I am in India at the moment. Um, and India has a lot of difficulties with religion, specifically. Um, there are real tensions. There are real tensions right here <laughs> in Jammu and Kashmir um, between Hindus and Muslims. And I'm going to take an example outside the scope of that uh, I'll take the example of the Sikh religion. What makes a collection of people Sikh? What makes any one individual Sikh? It is a shared collection of beliefs, a shared set of behaviors, and in some cases, a shared appearance. And as we begin to examine this collection of people that we call Sikh, we start to realize, oh, we're like in the taxonomy, there's not, there's not just one banner, right? Sikh, and here are all the people. Actually, it breaks down, there's, there's more complex taxonomy under that banner, Sikh. And there are other categories and there's complexity under there. And we can try to break it apart and we can, this is a very Wikipedia sort of thing, right? Oh, these people are over here and they're about, ah, you know, a hundred thousand of those people. And then these people are over here and they're about 600,000 of them. 
um, and the, there's a slight language difference and you get into this game of categorization of um, constructing particular uh, sets, labels, nodes in a graph to place all these people. And if you start to really dissolve, right, you dissolve these groups and you dissolve these groups down to the individual. <laughs> you get down to the individual and you say, oh, okay, well, actually, now, now there's just this one person and there's this other one person over here and these are the differences between them. This person believes a slightly different thing. This person has this idea of God. This person has this idea of the Sikh religion, uh, the rules are interpreted in such a way. And this person has this idea of God, this idea of the religion, this idea of the rules. Um, and you realize that no two individuals in the Sikh religion have a unified view of that religion. There's a lot of overlap, but no two Muslims have a unified vision of Islam. No two Christians have a unified vision of Christianity. And what makes this even more complicated and more interesting is that take one individual, and now we'll, we'll leave the Sikhs aside because everyone is the same. Everyone operates on these same principles. Some Jain, some Christian, right? This lady is born, she, okay, now she's three years old and her mother and father teach her certain things and she has a certain idea about how the world works and now she's 30 years old and she has a certain idea about how the world works. She's done her own exploring, she's figured things out. Now she's 60 years old and she has a different idea of the world and she has a different view of how the world works. Every moment that that woman is alive from the moment that she's a little baby to the moment she dies, she has a different view of the world. She has a different perspective, constantly shifting. And in no two snapshots in time is that woman the same woman. She's not the same Jane. And so you look across all Jains or all Christians or all Muslims or all Hindus, and you see that not only are no two individuals the same with a shared sense of these are the ideals, these are the beliefs, but those individuals are not the same and do not have a shared set of beliefs from one moment to the other, from one day to the next. They're learning, they are changing. The tribe that they subscribe to is, as I said, gossamer. <laughs> it's evolving with them. It is aggregate. Uh, it is a composition of all these individuals within it. And over time, uh, these ideas, these big high-level banners that we apply to these different ideas, they shift altogether um, and become other things. And um, everything I've just described is a philosophy. This is the same philosophy as, oh, castes, we're all the same. Oh, I don't see color. Same philosophy. Um, but it is inherently true. I don't think anyone can argue against this. There, there's no real argument to be made for the other side. Oh, no, I've seen two Muslim guys. They were the same. <laughs> they had the same mindset. Um, they believed exactly the same things. Um, no one could make that claim because it's an insane claim to make. And to see that, oh, okay, my rational mind tells me that this is true, that no two individuals can share a, a unified mindset, a shared mindset, um, with any kind of real meaningful significance to the shared mindset. Um, to take that rational perspective and embody it in yourself is uh, one of the benefits of meditation. So to take yourself apart <laughs> um, is to see 
this individual case, one person sliced up into time, changing from one moment to the next. If you can see that in yourself, then all these categories that you've applied to yourself, all the tribes you've applied to yourself, um, mean a lot less. So, oh yes, I'm, I'm Canadian, I'm white-skinned, I speak English, um, I'm liberal-ish. Um, I have all these ideas about my belief structures and the ideas that I have about the way that the world works and the groups that I belong to. Those start to really fall apart when you start to tease yourself apart into these smaller pieces. And this is the experiential quality of meditation. Um, but I will, I will try to dig into that a little bit more in the next video without going too long, <laughs> if I can. So I hope everyone has uh, a good Monday. I hope everyone is finding meditation practices that are universal, belong to every tribe. Um, and I hope that you're all taking good care of yourself and everyone around you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.